Aloha and good afternoon. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz, joining you from the breaking news show in Honolulu. And as always with me is Dr. Peter Tarlow in College Station, Texas. Beautiful picture, Peter. Is this for real or did you paint this there? No, this is for real. These are um, the state flower. This is blue bonnets. And right now, um, Texas at this time of year is filled with wildflowers. So there's uh, an orange flower called Indian sagebrush. There is a pink flower, but the state flower is the blue bonnet, which you are seeing a picture of right now. And as you drive the highways of Texas, you know we don't have any great mountains or where I live there are no oceans, but um, we do have literally a sea of flowers, and and the flowers are just beautiful. They they last for about another two weeks, and then unfortunately it gets hot and dry. And we have <laughs> we have yellow grass, but uh, but this time of year, and this was a cold winter, and it was a rainy winter, <clears throat> and it brings out the blue bonnet. So the state is it's just filled with with flowers wherever you go. Well, I hope uh, you have better weather than um, there was in Mississippi, but of course it's horrible. And yeah. uh, I can tell you here in Hawaii today, it's uh, quite rainy. We have a major storm front i think about 300 miles in the ocean i said it would just barely pass our island so but it's uh dark a little bit and uh rainy and windy a little bit so i don't know how it is you, you need to come to texas where we have blue skies and um a pleasant sun and it was 82 degrees today yeah it's a probably the temperature is very similar here but it's not too dry here today yeah. but the difference is when you um in the middle <clears> of the <throat> You'll still be around 82, 83 degrees, and we'll be at 105 degrees. So <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a lot colder. 40 degrees here is not, uh, 40 degrees Celsius is not a big surprise in Texas. But I think in Hawaii, you never get to 40 degrees Celsius. No, that, I, don't, I don't, we don't need that. But <laughs> that'll be, with this humidity, it would be horrible here, I guess, you know. But we're very humid also. We, I tell people living in uh, my part of Texas, it's like living in a boiling bottle of oil of Olay. Um, yeah, and I mean, uh, I, I, we, we haven't talked for a while. I was in Germany, as you know, attending the ITB trade show, and it was miserable from the weather. I mean, it was yes. snowing, it was cold, it was rainy. Yes. I mean, it could have gotten not any worse from the weather, but it was a great event. <clears throat> the industry is coming together again, even yes. though it was a lot smaller this time. Um, not. You know, and uh, but it's just a restart. So I think we're back in business. Yeah. The world is yeah. back in business. Well, now, of course, the big issue is going to be will we stay in business? And, you know, there's so many uh, bank failures. Um, Germany's having all sorts of strikes. And um, Deutsche Bank is having some real issues. And, you know, if it's a little bank like uh, Silicon Valley, not that it's that little, but it's still relatively small, you can absorb it. If Deutsche Bank or Credit Suisse have problems, that's a much bigger issue because these are huge international banks that have their fingers in pies all over the world. So I'm uh, really praying that Deutsche Bank mm. doesn't go under because that would be really... Yeah, Deutsche Bank is not only Deutsche Bank. Part of Deutsche Bank is Postbank, what is a very yeah. um, important financial institution Deutsche Bank bought, and it's connected to the German Postal okay. Service. So... Yeah, it would have all kinds of uh, consequences, I would think. And and of course, in Germany, you mentioned strike and um, attitude in the aviation industry is bad. I can tell you a little story <clears throat> in a minute, but uh, yesterday on Monday, nothing moved anymore in Germany. I mean, there yeah. were buses, local, uh, regional buses, all the train service came to a complete halt. <clears throat> no airline took off from Germany and it was like really and even the freeways uh, the strike was from the Verdi Union and even uh, freeway maintenance is done by the same union so they had to actually close portions of freeways and there were um, backups sometimes I think the worst was 120 kilometers mm. where nothing moved on top of nothing else moving so People, for some reason, I would be very angry, but people said, we understand this and these people need to get paid better. So there seems to be some issues. Yeah. Um, but here's but, the balance. If you're the local person, you understand it. 
And, you know, if you miss a day, the sky doesn't fall down. But if you're going to the airport or you're a visitor and all of a sudden everything's on strike, you don't have local resources. And that really becomes a real mess for people and they can't get home to get to work. They have to explain to their bosses why they're not, you know, they're not there. And um, that makes flying even more of a hassle than it is. And it's, and flying is not fun, you know, unless you're really on a first class <laughs> airline such as Qatar, you know, first class <laughs> really type of airline. Most flying is, is tends to be miserable. If you're in a U.S. carrier, American or United, or I haven't been on Delta for a while, but even business class or business first or whatever they call it, it's really sort of economy with a smile. Um, if you even get the smile. Yeah, the smile is a different story. And I can tell you about smile and the atmosphere in Düsseldorf when I landed on United Airlines in Frankfurt <clears throat> last month. I had a connecting flight on Lufthansa to Berlin, and both airlines are part of the Star Alliance system, so they should be working together. And I had a almost five, six hour layover. So I could have taken the train in three hours or four hours and get to Berlin. So I thought, okay, there are three other flights in between. It would be quite easy for Lufthansa to say oh, we book you on an earlier flight because none of these flights were completely sold out, and I'm a um, on a high up on the United Airlines chain. And I tell you, when I went to the transit counter for, uh, manned by Lufthansa within the international transit area, the lady on the gold lane—that's the lane supposedly for the better customers like me. She looked at my boarding pass issued by United Airlines and said, no, I cannot help you. You have to deal with United Airlines. I said, but I'm flying on Lufthansa and I wanted to get an earlier flight. Well, then you should have not booked it with United. So, and, and I thought it was so rude. She didn't even want to look at my reservation. So I went, uh, I went away and I talked to a gentleman who was doing a lot of the screening for people to go into what line, but there were no lines. And I asked him who the manager is and he pointed me to the other direction and there was a guy sitting there reading the newspaper and she comes dashing from the back and um, the guys didn't even know what it didn't even want to know what I had to say he just says you know my colleague already told you no one here at this counter will help you so uh, it was completely rude so I you know I, I went away and I took a picture very visible of them I was just angry and within like a minute I, airport security, two actually nice people, it was a lady and a guy come running and asked, telling me I cannot take pictures. I said, why couldn't I take pictures? And he said, apparently it violates privacy laws and I need to get the consent for these people to take pictures. But by the way, it's not true. Yeah. Well, yeah. apparently it was, it was true because uh, I refused to show them my camera and I said, well, I guess uh, but I'm not. You cannot make me to do that. I asked her, and he said no. But uh, then we have to call the police. So she pushed some button, and then there's two. He, they were pushing you, though. Though international law says that if you are outside of your private property, you, I have the right to take your picture, and that's the whole concept between the paparazzis. And um, you may not like it but you can't stop me from taking that. What they were doing is bullying you because they, they're saying, well, we're going to call the police and you're just going to give in. But anybody who knows international law will tell you by convention between all the various countries, I cannot take a picture of you in your home and I cannot take a picture of you in a bathroom, but I can take a picture of you in a public space and an airport is a public space. Yeah, and that was kind of my argument and then the other police officer. And I have to say they weren't really... I didn't feel like I getting bullied. They were quite understandable. It no, they were bullied. they were politely bullied. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they had machine guns, and you don't really want to mess with them, you know. And <laughs> well, all right, <laughs> you kind of prove my point there. The bottom <laughs> line is that you were within your rights, and what they were doing, and this is very typical of airlines, they hold back information. Right. For example, I was uh, last week, and I have a meeting tomorrow with United about this. Um, I was in Tel Aviv. They didn't tell anyone they were canceling their flight. And now I discovered they knew that flight was going to be canceled from 8 o'clock in the evening. They let everybody come to the airport, even though the flight was going to take off. At 11.30, they announced, oh, we canceled the flight, which is now an hour and a half late. They go get your bags. And of course, by the time 
everybody got their bag. It was now over 12 o'clock, and you couldn't check into a hotel till 11 o'clock the next morning. There was no customer service. There was no one there to help anyone. And when I screamed and yelled at the, at, at the counter, the man said, well, of course there's someone here to help you. I said, where's the person? He said, well, it's not my fault. You can't see him. I said, so we have invisible people? Uh, <laughs> and, and, and then coming back to the United States on the plane, the flight attendants told me, yeah, they knew from the beginning if they just pushed and denied then most people would give up and just walk away. Yeah, and that's basically, I think, what's banking on, and people seem to be frustrated. And I can understand this if you are in a situation like in Germany when none of the bags came because the baggage claim people were on strike. Of course, they get yelled at by everyone. You don't want to have this job. And I understand when they just got up and said, I have enough, I go home. So these <laughs> things happen. In my case, it was slightly different because there was no one at the counter. I was the only one, and they had three agents, and they wouldn't even take the time to help. So I'm questioning really the effectiveness of Star Alliance because uh, the, the staff apparently means absolutely nothing. It does. Uh, for example, when I'm, um, I have to go on Copa, which is Star Alliance. You know, it's, it's America is a spinoff from Continental, which of course then got taken over mm -hmm. by United. And, you know, and I'll say to them, I'm 1K. And the lady looks at me and says, that's nice. But, you know, it, if you think we're going to do anything for you, you're crazy. Um, and this is, um, I find throughout the whole Star Alliance, uh, you might get some miles. But, you know, the miles today are worthless because if you're looking to get um, a status, you know, uh, 1K or platinum or whatever it happens to be, it's now not based on miles anymore. It's based on the amount of money you spend. So yeah. you have to show that you've spent at least $24,000 a year to get to 1K. So giving me miles is somewhat silly, you know, because it's not going to change my status at all. And this is a, a real problem that we're seeing not only in airlines, but also th these loyalty programs are not true also in hotels where they, you know, play all sorts of games with you. And, yeah, and I, uh, Peter, and then just uh, playing games, I'm just about to actually do a story on it. And this uh, goes to Bonvoy, what's the program, probably the largest loyalty program in hotels operated by Marriott, the largest right. searching. And uh, recently I was in Saudi Arabia and I spent six nights in a Marriott hotel. The bill was about $700 a night. And I won't get it. Not which, is a lot, which is a lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. There's not one point I got. There's not one status night I got because it was booked through a travel agency. And they yeah. don't like this. So it's only only get your miles and your points and your status when you actually book it yourself, pay on a credit card, on your app. And sometimes, especially if you travel on business, it's not always possible to do that. No, so, and the other thing is sometimes the prices are different. And, you know, <clears throat> they... Well, I, I even noticed in the Hilton system, I was a uh, Hilton Rewards, and the lady said to me, of course you're not getting any miles or points or anything, because you booked this online, but you didn't book it on our line, you booked it on somebody else's line. Yes, and that's kind of really the trend um, for uh, hotels to do this, to steal your points and make it impossible to actually get status, because in the case of um, Marriott, in, in my case, I needed 16 more nights to maintain a status by the end of March. And um, I had these nights, uh, more than these nights, but I now I cannot have the status because I, it was paid through another party or through, I mean, through a travel agency. Makes absolutely no sense. Um, and, and, and hotels are, Nicole, and, and they're kind of hurting themselves with this because yeah. at the end, it's the opposite of loyalty. I have absolutely no incentive now because I'm not going to get my status raised till the end of the year. Um, why would I stay with Marriott? I mean, yeah. that kind of blew it, you know? <laughs> yes, tomorrow my conversation with United, I'm going to point out to them that I bring, um, this year I'm going to take, I'm taking another 20 people to Israel. I'm taking 25 people to Portugal, taking 25 people to um, Spain. So, you know, I should be worth a lot of money to them because it's not just my ticket. I'm booking these people 
you know, so it's 25, 25, mm -hmm. another 75 tickets are gaining because of me. Well, you know what? If I don't have any loyalty now to United, I can go to some other airline and it doesn't really matter. No, it, it doesn't matter. And it's, uh, uh, you know, it's the, the hotels are really trying. I just stayed in California, actually, uh, for a couple of nights at the Thompson Hotel, which is part of the Hyatt chain. And uh, they added a 5% surcharge to my restaurant bill and saying it's the health and wellness charge for our employees. Yeah. So it's apparently pays for health insurance for people who work at Hyatt or at this Hyatt hotel. So they're now charging guests a surcharge so their staff can have health insurance. I have nothing against health insurance. I want everyone to have health insurance. But why would I get charged extra as a guest? I Especially mean, when you look at the amount of money that the administrators make in these large hotels. Right, right. You know, in other words, if they were living as a, all of them working together, hand to mouth, eh, maybe you're right. But considering that these, you know, the heads of airlines and the heads of major hotel chains are making millions of dollars, and none of this is trickling down to um, the <laughs> workers. And then they're expecting the customer to pay for it so it doesn't come out of their pocket. Well, the system in Europe in this way, I have to say specifically in Germany in this case, is quite a bit more transparent because it would be against the law to search these type of surcharges. When you see a hotel bill, you can test it at Marriott, Hyatt, or Hilton, whatever you like. And you see it's uh, uh, advertised for 250 euro a night. That's what you pay. Taxes are included, all surcharges, fees, whatever it is. Yeah, is of, course we, of course, that's also hiding it because we don't know if, it's, if they haven't just wrapped it into that bill. Yeah, in but it's words, in the bill, so at least you know what you pay because the, the, the bottom line is at the end, you pay money. Well, I don't care what I agree. the taxes I mean, are. and that's also the issue of sales tax. You know, in Europe or Israel or much of the world, if I go to the store and it says it's $100, it's $100. Now, right. there's sales tax in it, but I don't see it. I, what I pay is what I see at the store. Yeah, but you don't really care the, because you know yeah. it's $100. Right? right, exactly. But in the United States, when they say it's $100, it's really not $100. It's $108 or $112 because there's a sales tax on top of that. And you see that, for example, when people negotiate cars. You have to, when you buy a new car, you have to say, don't tell me the price. Tell me the walkout price. Yes, because that's really what counts. Is the, I don't care what the price is. I want to know what is it going to cost me to walk out with that car. Exactly. And you know, and 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 that's so the business of putting sales tax on top of it, which is throughout the United States, I really don't like. Most of the world has the sales tax wrapped into the price, so you know if you can afford it or not. You're not. It's same thing with restaurants. I was recently at a um, Indian restaurant here. Very nice buffet, though I thought it was for Texas incredibly expensive. And it was $16. But then there was another 15% for this and 8% tax. And by the time I left, it was $20. Now, you know, I would have preferred to have said, okay, the buffet is going to cost you $20, not the buffet is going to cost you $15.99, but you're really going to pay $20. Yes. And that's really, I think, the, the truth in, it's like the truth in lending law, you know, that yeah. is now, in fact, there should be a truth in the sales. And uh, mm -hmm. when you go from state to state, taxes are different, sometimes not existing, some other taxes are quite high. Uh, when you see a price, you should understand, this is what I'm paying. Right. And that's why I like the system in Europe more, even though the taxes are by far higher. But yes. you don't really realize it because you know yes. 100 euros. And, and that's not just Europe. That's most of the world. You might say it the other way around. You don't like the system in the United States because it's but, it, it, this is the exception, not the rule. But I think what you're really seeing here is that these are real threats to the tourism industry. And the tourism industry is facing many places where there's um, physical altercations such as in Paris, where not only are there riots, and of course they burnt down the city hall in Bordeaux, and then the King of England had to postpone his travel mm -hmm. to France because it was too dangerous, but also the fact that um, there, everyone, all the garbage people in France are on strike. So there's garbage all over the streets of Paris and the other French cities. Um, you see this in problems um, from one part of the world to the other, 
And of course you see crime and you put all those together and people are gonna start questioning. I get lousy service on plane. I'm ripped off at a restaurant. Um, they're not nice to me at a hotel. Um, we're saying that travel's coming back, but you know what? You can kill the goose that lays the golden egg. And if the tourism industry doesn't wake up, it's gonna be back to crying again as if it were COVID, but this time it will be a self-induced COVID. Yeah, and that is really the danger. And of course, we don't have enough people to um, to man this industry uh, to make it uh, feasible actually to function. And uh, so there's there's still a lot to do. Um, yes. If yes. you um, if you really yes. yes, I was still looking on the flight from Tel Aviv to Newark. It's supposed to have twelve flight attendants, and they have nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens is, is the the flight attendants are exhausted because. Serving 350 people with nine flight attendants is really hard. And especially when two of them are assigned to, you know, first class. And then the service is terrible. So you're paying still, you know, $2,000 for a ticket. <clears throat> and you can barely get a glass of water. Well, you can see why people are angry. Well, um, I, I had the pleasure of flying Qatar Airways uh, recently a number of times. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, look, I mean, to be fair, the government uh, substitutes this airline probably, but the service, it cannot, couldn't get any better. I wouldn't know how they could possibly improve it. And um, uh, it's, it was just really refreshing. And then, uh, of course, I did fly business class for this, uh, maybe different than in coach, but it really over the top. I mean, you literally, you can fly that through Los Angeles to Doha and back, and you can be uh, on the plane and eat as much as you want. You have a and drink as much as you want. You have your own cabin. You can close the door. You put a do not disturb sign on it. When you're ready to eat, you ring the bell and someone brings you food. And, and it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Well, that is the exception to the rule, not the rule. Because I think most people, both on European airlines, certainly American carriers and Latin American carriers, you're lucky if they feed you. I'm going, I'm first class to Morelia tomorrow in Mexico, and they don't even have a snack. And it's at six o'clock in the evening, still a two and a half hour flight. And you know what the difference between first class and um, economy is? You get your water in a glass versus a plastic cup. Well, I can tell you on Qatar Airways on the one and a half hour flight from Doha to Riyadh, you get a full meal. I had actually filet steak, uh, with a nice vegetable and potato and a dessert and a little bit of uh, appetizer, some hummus, and all actually served one by one, not all just put on one plate. Yeah. And I love I love this uh, mint tea. And uh, at, at the end, when you land, you get another piece of chocolate just for buying them. And that's on an hour and a half flight. So yeah, well, that's that. Uh, you know, this will be a two and a half hour flight, and I'll get water. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're picking right. the destination, Peter. But I wish right. you well, listen, and have a, a wonderful you. trip to Mexico. Thank you. And you have, and uh, one of the things in Mexico we have to, I will be working on a lot, is issues of tourism security. Because as you know, Mexico is going through a very hard period of time. Yes, so. absolutely. And uh, that is something they really have to improve on. And I think everyone knows yes. And if they don't, in the end, it's going to really, again, kill their goose that's laying a golden egg. Well, on that happy note, I will speak. I will be calling you from Mexico, and then we will do another program next week. Perfect. Sounds good, Peter. Thank Just you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. And everyone else, if you're watching this and you want to watch it again, just stay tuned. We're going to repeat it every two hours. And uh, you can also go to breaking... <clears throat> at uh, uh, breakingtravelnews.com and you will always uh, find all our different showcases we have or you go to our YouTube channel youtube.com slash travel news group and you can find everything we did and there are hundreds of broadcasts again thank you for joining us and please stay tuned and you can watch us again aloha bye bye